section. So let's pray first. Father, thank you that our Lord Jesus Christ was transferred from a realm of death to the realm of light. And we look forward, Lord, to that day when we will follow our leader in that great transfer from death to life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Turn down your Bibles, if you would please, to our key verse here, which is uh, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19. As I said, most of our, our uh, study this morning is going to the resurrection is going to be in the book of Isaiah. We're going to stay here. Book of Isaiah, chapter 26, verse 19. <clears throat> Isaiah 26, 19, where God says, Thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. <clears throat> the, um, the book of Isaiah tells us several things about the resurrection. And that's what we want to have as our focus this morning. Five points, in fact, about the resurrection. First, the book of Isaiah will tell, tells us about the need for the resurrection, our need for the resurrection. Second, the book of Isaiah will tell us about the reality of the resurrection. It really happened. And third, the book of Isaiah will tell us how the resurrection changes our view of death. And fourth, how the resurrection is not for everyone. It was intended for everyone, but it's not for everyone. And last, we will see in the book of, the book of Isaiah, the person who is responsible for the resurrection. Sorry, six point. The one, the last one is the cost of the resurrection. So these are the six points that we're going to see in the book of Isaiah, and it'll be the focus of our meditation this morning. And it is, first of all, the need for the resurrection, the reality of the resurrection, the res how the resurrection changes our view of death, and the resurrection to life is not for all, and the person who's responsible for the resurrection and the cost of the resurrection, all revealed in the book of Isaiah. So, first of all, the book of Isaiah starts off in the first chapter with a raging condemnation that's leveled against the sinful, and in that case here, leading the pack is the state of Israel. And that applies, however, to all men, where God says in the first chapter of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 4, a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should you be stricken anymore? You revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. When our first forefather, our, the first man who lived on earth, Adam, made that, that fatal, terrible decision that he was going to rebel against God, he brought on all of us a disease, a disease of sin. And we became the embodiment of this description in Isaiah 1-4. We became the embodiment. We became sinful. We became weighed down with iniquity. When others saw sin, we became instructors to others of sin, of, of, that, uh, of how to sin, there's not one of us who have not become sinful because the Bible says in Romans 3.23, Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 5.12, Romans 5.12 speaks about what Adam did when it says in Romans 5.12, whereas as by one man sin entered into the world. And that made God really angry. It made him mad. And as a result, God sentenced all men to death. That's where death came from. Romans 6.23. Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. Romans 5.12. Romans 5.12 says, Whereas, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed, upon all men, for that all have sinned. 
And the book of Isaiah tells us what the sentence of death means. In Isaiah, 20, in Isaiah 38, 10, Isaiah 38, 10, it says, I said in the cutting off of my days, I shall go down to the gates of the grave. I am deprived of the residue of my years. I said, I shall not see the Lord, even the Lord in the land of the living. I shall behold man no more with the inhabitants of the world. That description pretty much sums up death. Isaiah 38.10, Isaiah 38.10, first of all, speaks of death as the cutting off of my days. No matter how old a person is, when they come to die, there is the feeling of, I really am too young to die, as they have so much more that they want to do in life. Death, as described in Isaiah 38.10, Isaiah 38.10, is a feeling of being deprived of the residue of my years. No matter how old a person is, when death comes, the feeling is, I'm deprived. I'm deprived from enjoying more of life. I'm deprived from traveling more, from going on cruises. I'm deprived of being with my family. I'm deprived from seeing my family members get married, graduate, have families, etc. Death brings this feeling of being deprived. And death that is being referred to is not the death of the body, which is a one-time event, but it is an everlasting state of being separated, separated, deprived, deprived most importantly from God, who's the source of all good. Isaiah 38, 11, Isaiah 38, 11 says, I said, I shall not see the Lord in the land of the living. Our relationships, our relationship with God is is absolutely vital, it's life. Our relationship with other people invigorate us, they thrill us, they, they cause us, they, they bring us a life, the energy from relationship with other people. But in the place of everlasting death, which the Bible calls hell, it's a place described as Isaiah 38, 11, Isaiah 38, 11, I shall behold man no more with the inhabitants of the world. The Bible says the Bible says that hell is not only a place where there's separation from God, but hell is also a place where there's separation from other people. Hell is the loneliest place in the universe. The hostages who were held under the ground in Gaza said that the worst experience they had was when they were locked up alone. And they talked about how much better it was when there were other hostages with them. Each Hostage in hell, the literal hell, is alone with no other contact with other people. Hell is solitary confinement. But the good news is, the good news is, is that the, the resurrection from the dead into a new life is a reality. And we're told about that in Isaiah 60, verse 1. Isaiah 60, verse 1, which says, Arise, shine, for thy light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Death for the believer is called in the Bible falling asleep. It's a state of sleep in 1 Thessalonians 4.14. 1 Thessalonians 4.14, which says, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Death is called, in that verse of 1 Thessalonians 4.14, 1 Thessalonians 4.14, it's called sleep in Jesus. The resurrection is when God wakes up those who sleep in Jesus. And the way that God wakes up those who sleep and have died in Christ is with what the Bible calls a shout, a shout, in 1 Thessalonians 4.16. 1 Thessalonians 4.16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The shout that we will hear, the shout that we will hear in the resurrection will be the Isaiah 60 verse 1 shout. Isaiah 60, verse 1, Arise, rise, shine, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. 
God is not willing that any person should not be resurrected to life. Everyone will be resurrected, but there are two roads, a resurrection to life and a resurrection to damnation. And God is not willing that anyone should be cast into hell and have a resurrection to damnation. Because the Bible says in 2 Peter 3.9, 2 Peter 3.9, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The greatest weapon that has been formed against man is the weapon of death, it's the weapon of hell, it's the weapon of the devil, all against us. But the Bible says in Isaiah 54, 17, Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. The only reason why a person would not be resurrected to life, the only reason why a person would be cast into hell after being resurrected to damnation is because of sinfulness. But God has devised a way, God has devised a way that all those weapons of sin and death and hell and the devil, all devised, all weapons that are devised against us, they wouldn't prosper because he's devised a way for the righteousness of Jesus Christ to be transferred to our account. And this is what is meant when God says in Isaiah 54, 17, Isaiah 54, 17, their righteousness is of me. 1 Corinthians 1, 20, 1 Corinthians 30, 1 Corinthians 1, 30 says, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us righteousness. This transferring, to our account of the righteousness of Christ is how God helps us to become resurrected from the dead. As it says in Isaiah 41.10, Isaiah 41.10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. You know, there's a vivid picture in the Bible of what it means to be resurrected. And it's in the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, it's the life of Joseph. Joseph, there was the time in Joseph's life when he was, when he was in the prison, the, 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 the Pharaoh's prison, which was an underground prison, the worst prison he could be in, under the earth in Egypt. And when he was sentenced to that underground prison, it was like Joseph died and was buried in the earth when he was in that underground prison. Then came the time when quickly, so quickly, Joseph was taken out that it said he didn't even have time to, to wash or shave, but it was instantly he was called out of that prison and he stood before Pharaoh. And at the end of that meeting, Pharaoh exalted him to a place of rulership in Egypt. That's a picture of the resurrection. That's a picture, and we can imagine Joseph as ruler over Egypt, and thinking about his time in his life when he was in that underground prison, and how quickly he was brought out of that prison. That will be the thought of all who are resurrected to life with Christ in heaven. As I think back about the time when they were in the ground, as we just sang, lo, in the grave he lay, and then up, from the grave he arose. For us to know, for us to know that because of Christ, that our stay in the grave is only temporary, gives us great hope, great hope. And this is part, this hope of the resurrection, it changes our view of death. It changes how we view death. This verse in Isaiah 26, 19, our key verse, Isaiah 26, 19, brings about a change of how we see death. Thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. That's Christ. That's Christ speaking about together with my dead body. We will be resurrected because Christ was resurrected. His dead body was resurrected and caused to live. Therefore, our dead bodies shall live. 
Isaiah 26, 19. Isaiah 26, 19, thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. As for the resurrection, the Bible describes Jesus Christ as the first one to be resurrected, and then us as we follow Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. In Isaiah 26, 19, our key verse, it's Jesus Christ who is speaking when he says, thy dead men shall live together with my dead body shall they arise. The, 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 the title that Jesus Christ loved to speak of himself was the Son of Man. More than any other title, he referred to himself as the Son of Man. As the Son of Man, he's our brother. And as our brother, he died just like we die, exactly the same. He was buried just like we will be buried. But that gives, that gives body and meaning to this phrase in Isaiah 26, 19, to Isaiah 26, 19, where he says, thy dead men shall live together with my dead body shall they arise. Isaiah 55, 4. Isaiah 55, 4 speaks about what God the Father did for Jesus Christ and the position that he gave him when it says in Isaiah 55, 4, behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and commander to the people. In the resurrection, Jesus Christ is the leader that is leading us in the resurrection to life, as seen in Hebrews 2.10. Hebrews 2.10. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. That is the picture of us being brought together with the dead body of Jesus Christ in the resurrection following the death. And, is, and that is a picture of Christ bringing many sons to glory as the leader and the commander. And what's the response of, the resurrection, of those who are resurrected to life? The response is Isaiah 26, 19. Isaiah 26, 19. Arise and sing. That's what we just did. We just sung about the glories of the resurrection and what it means for us. The resurrection is a time of such great joy. The only response is just to sing for joy. And Isaiah, Isaiah had, this, had this feeling of joy that he wanted to sing when he saw had, how God had clothed him with new clothes in Isaiah 61.10. Isaiah 61.10, when Isaiah said, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself. After sin, the feeling that Adam and Eve had was naked, stripped, exposed, and they felt embarrassed, and they felt ashamed. And so God, in the resurrection, clothes us. He clothes the naked, naked, but with a wonderful clothes called, in Isaiah 61.10, Isaiah 61.10, the garments of salvation, the robe of righteousness. Sometimes, when, when I'm fishing and looking for fish, and I'm going all over the place there. And sometimes I find myself in water. The sonar tells me that I'm in water that's just too shallow. It's too shallow. And I know it's too shallow. There's no fish here. It's too shallow. Life is too shallow to think that when you're dead, you're dead and you cease to exist. That's too shallow. God did not make us that way. God did not make us to only hope and dream in this short life. God has put the desire in our, in our hearts to live for eternity. He's put this in the, and, 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 and we can see this in a verse in Ecclesiastes 3.11, Ecclesiastes 3.11, which I want to read to you from the New American Standard, from the New American Standard, where it says, 
He has made everything appropriate in his time. He has also set eternity in their hearts. We have embedded, implanted within our hearts eternity. Eternity in our hearts means that God has set into the heart of man a desire to live forever, a desire to dream forever, a desire to hope forever, a desire to achieve forever, a desire to soar forever, a desire... All these are only possible with the resurrection because the Bible says that to only live for this short time on earth with no resurrection, to only love for this short time on earth with no resurrection, to only hope for this short time on earth with no resurrection, to only dream for this short time on earth with no resurrection, the Bible has one word to describe that, miserable, miserable, 1 Corinthians 15, 16. 1 Corinthians 15, 16. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead. He's become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Every man in his order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ that is coming. Then cometh the end when he shall deliver it up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, he must reign till he have put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. But the resurrection, the resurrection doesn't look like a reality to the eyes of sight. The eyes of sight see a dead body. The eyes of sight see the body de decomposing in the grave. The eyes of sight see dust. They see buried in the graves. In the Middle East, in the Middle East, I know our cemeteries here are all nicely irrigated and green and and, and, but in the Middle East, when the sun beat down, beats down on cemeteries, those cemeteries become a dry place of dust. And dust blows over those cemeteries. And the eyes of sight, when they look at that dust, say, impossible that the buried can rise again because this cemetery is a place of dust. But we don't walk in, in life with the eyes of sight. We walk in life with the eyes of faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Because the eyes of faith says, even though all I see in death is dust, we believe that the resurrection will happen as described in Isaiah 26, 19, our verse. Isaiah 26, 19. Awake and sin, sing, awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust. Dust has no water, and there can be no life where there's no water. In the Middle East, it's the dew of the morning that brings life to the plants, as God says in our verse, uh, Isaiah 26, 19, Isaiah 26, 19, Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs. And then, God gives a very interesting description of the resurrection in that verse 19, verse 19, where God says, the earth shall cast out the dead. Again, the New American Standard translates this verse in, uh, in verse, 19, verse 19. The earth will give birth to the departed spirits. Give birth. That's the imagery. It's that when a, when, when, when a person dies in Christ and is buried in the earth, that the earth becomes pregnant with that dead soul, the dead soul in Christ. And just like in pregnancy, the womb carries the baby only for so long before the womb says to the baby, you gotta go. And labor starts and travail begins that ends in the baby, whether he likes it or not, being cast out of the womb. That's the image 
that's presented to us of the resurrection in Isaiah 26, 19, verse 19. The earth is pregnant with the bodies of the saved, and the resurrection is a time when the earth will, with one heave of travail, give up its death, and the shout, as the shout comes in verse 19, verse 19, awake and sing. This is why the earth is described as travailing to give birth in Romans 8.22, Romans 8.22. We know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. That's saying that the whole earth is in a state of, of, of labor from pregnancy in pain together until now. With the placement of each believer into the grave on earth, the earth groans, the earth travails as it looks forward to the time when with one big heave, the earth will give birth and yield up its dead in Christ into the resurrection to be with Christ. Just like the tomb of Christ, when the earth shook and Christ came out, as the hymn puts it, and as we sung this morning, death cannot keep its prey, Jesus my, th my Savior. He tore the bars away, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. And when the earth travails and gives up its dead in Christ, there was, there was no stone for Christ big enough to keep him in the grave. And because we believe in the resurrection, we have hope. And that hope is called hope in death. In so Proverbs 14, 32, Proverbs 14, 32, the wicked is driven away in his wickedness, but the righteous hath hope in his death. This is how the resurrection totally changes our view of death. The resurrection changes our view of death from the dry deterioration of the body resulting in death described in Psalm 22, 15, Psalm 22, 15, which Christ said, the dust of death, the dust of death, into a life-giving water that Christ gives us, as he said in John 4.14, 4, John 4.14, 4, whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The resurrection changes our view of death from dust to do. Verse 19, verse 19, ye that dwell in dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs. The resurrection changes our view of death as we see death approaching. And that becomes, from our changed view of death, just a time to prepare, a time to prepare to end life, a, to a time to prepare to start life. End life on earth, start life above. The resurrection changes our view of when it comes time to die is a time just to get ready for life. You know, this reminds me of a little seven-year-old girl named Neri who returned to her destroyed home in, in, uh, in the south of Israel in the Kibbutz Beri. And, and she was only there for a brief time, and they, they had a little television clip about it. And, and uh, then she was going to go back to the hotel where she was living in Elat. And, 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 and she was so excited to, 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 to go back, and, and she, was, she had a little basket, and she says, oh, can I take this, can I take that, you know? And she went to the cupboard, and she says, oh, I'm so glad the terrorists didn't take the chewing gum. <laughs> but that's a picture of how the resurrection has changed our view of life. The resurrection has made the time before death just to be a preparation for life, and it's given us the assurance of Colossians 3.14, Colossians 3.4, 3, Colossians 3.4, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. It's faith in the word of God of the reality of the resurrection that changes our view of death from anxiety to rest in what the Bible calls the rest in hope, the rest in hope. Psalm 16.9, Psalm 16.9. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. As much as verse 19, as much as verse 19 with its promise, thy dead men shall live, gives us an assurance 
of the reality of the resurrection. Gives us a change of view of, of, of death, the resurrection does. Just above that verse, 19, there's another verse. And that verse describes a totally different outcome. That verse is verse 14, just a few verses above verse 19, Isaiah 26, 14, Isaiah 26, 14, which says, they are dead, they shall not live, they are deceased, they shall not rise, therefore hast thou visited and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. The verse tells us of the destiny of another group of people that are described in verse 14, described in Isaiah 26, 14, as they are dead, they shall not live, they are deceased, they shall not rise. We must read these two verses together, verse, in Isaiah 29, verses 14 and 19. We have to read them together to see that there are two groups that are described. One group in verse 14 is the people who are, verse 14, dead, they shall not live, deceased, they shall not rise. That is the group of they shall not rise. And another group in verse, in, in, in verse 19, verse 19, thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. That's the they arise group. This shows that not everyone will rise in the resurrection of life. One group will rise to the resurrection of life and the other will rise in the resurrection to damnation. This is what is told to us in Daniel 12.2. Daniel 12.2 says, Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. The Daniel 12.2, awake to everlasting life, is the group of Isaiah 26.19. 26, they shall arise. The Daniel 12.2 group of awake to everlasting contempt is the Isaiah 26.14 group of they shall not rise. God wants everyone to be in the Daniel 2.12 group of awake to everlasting life known as the Isaiah 26.19 they arise. God does not, he doesn't want anyone to be in the Daniel 2.12 group of awake to everlasting contempt, also known as Isaiah 26, 14, they shall not rise. So the question is, what puts a person in the group of the resurrection to life? What puts a person in that group that, re that, 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 that is resurrected to life? And we're told, 1 John 5, 11 makes it so clear. 1 John 5, 11, and this is the record that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. If a person has, very simple, if a person has Jesus Christ, a person has life and will be in the resurrection to life group. If a person does not have Jesus Christ and a person does not have life and he's not in that resurrection to life group, he's in the resurrection to damnation group. How does a person get himself out of the Isaiah 26, 14, Isaiah 26, 14, no resurrection to life group and get himself into the Isaiah 26, 19, Isaiah 26, 19, resurrection to life group, which is really a question of how does a person get himself into the have Jesus Christ group? First, a person must tell God that he's a sinner. Isaiah 59, 12, Isaiah 59, 12. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our trans transgressions, we know them. Second, a person must repent of his sins. That simply means to turn around, to stop it. As Isaiah 59.20 says, Isaiah 59.20, Thy Redeemer shall come to Zion, 
and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. Third, a person must put his full confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ, which is called trusting in the Lord. As it says in Isaiah 26.3, Isaiah 26.3, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. And fourth is a person must make Jesus Christ his God. Isaiah 12.2, Isaiah 12.2, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. The word salvation in Isaiah 12.2, that verse, Isaiah 12.2, is the word Yeshua or Jesus. So Isaiah 12.2 is saying, Behold, God is my Jesus. He also is become my Jesus. So the four points of how to transfer out of the Isaiah 26, 14, not rise to life group, into the Isaiah 26, 19, rise to life group, the four points are, tell God you're a sinner. Turn away from sin. Trust in Jesus Christ. Make Jesus Christ your God. Because Jesus Christ is the person who's responsible for the resurrection to life. This is the description of him in Isaiah 25, 8. Isaiah 25, 8. He will swallow up death in victory. And the Lord will wipe away all tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off the earth. For the Lord has spoken it. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. He will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation or in his Jesus. Jesus Christ personally obtained the resurrection to life. It was so personal with him that in Isaiah 25, 8, Isaiah 25, 8, it tells us that in order to defeat death, in order to defeat that poison of death, it says he swallowed up death. He swallowed the poison. It killed him on the cross. And when the time comes for us to be resurrected to life and we see Christ who defeated death by swallowing up death, we can see ourselves gathering around, the Christ, gathering around Christ, gathering around Christ and saying, Isaiah 25, 9, Isaiah 25, 9, Lo, this is our God. We've waited for him. He will save us. This is the Lord We've waited for him. We'll be glad and rejoice in his salvation. It's impossible to separate the resurrection to life from the person of Jesus Christ, which is why Christ said to Martha in John eleven twenty. 20, John eleven twenty. 20, then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was still in the house. Then said Martha to Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, he will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall live again, shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And then he asked her, believest thou this? That's the question this morning. Are we really in Christ? Are we, do we really have the Son? Do we really believe this? When he, said, when he said, he that believeth in me, the word is kai, and it means he that believeth into me. What does that mean? The four points. Tell God you're a sinner repent of sins, trust in Christ, and make Christ your God. Jesus Christ is so linked to the resurrection to life that when it comes time for, for the dead in Christ to rise from the dead, it will be the voice of Jesus Christ himself that's gonna wake up the dead. John 5, 24, John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Jesus said, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has 
everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death into life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Jesus Christ is so linked to the resurrection that when after the resurrection he says, he says things like, it's I, myself, in Luke 24, 39. Luke 24, 39. After he was resurrected, he said, behold my hands and my feet. It's I, myself. Our resurrection to life was not free. It came at a great cost, but not a cost that we had to pay. All the costs for our resurrection came at the expense of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to earth to purchase our resurrection to life. That's why he came. That's why he lived on earth, because his life was a path that led to death. Jesus Christ thirsted for death because through death he would defeat the obstacles that stood in the way of us going to heaven. The obstacle of sin, the obstacle of death, the obstacle of the devil that blocked us from the resurrection to life. And we can see how Jesus Christ thirsted for death when he said in Luke 1250, Luke 1250, I have a baptism to be baptized with and how I am straightened until it be accomplished. He was talking about death. When Christ said in Luke 1250, Luke 1250, that he was straightened, that it should be accomplished, the Greek word for straightened there, suneko, is a word that has several sides, several meanings, but they're all really the same. It has the meaning of being compressed, of being arrested, of being taken up with, of being preoccupied. So it means that Christ was compressed to die to obtain our resurrection. Christ was arrested with the aim to die, to open up our resurrection to life. Christ was taken up with the purpose to die so we could be resurrected. Christ was preoccupied with the resolution to die to purchase our resurrection. And paying the price for our resurrection was Christ's stated purpose for why he came to earth, as he said in Matthew 20, 28, Matthew 20, 28, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. Christ was so consumed with opening up the life gate for us to be resurrected to life that when he was talking in a conversation with Elijah and Moses, it was the topic of the conversation in Luke 9.30, Luke 9.30. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish in Jerusalem. We don't think of death as an accomplishment, but it was for him. Because in his death, he accomplished the, 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 the purchase for our resurrection to life. Christ felt keenly his need to fulfill his father's commission. His father's commission was that he should take away the sin so we could be resurrected to life. John 10, 17, John 10, 17. Therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down in myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. The joy that Christ had is in seeing, it, it was a seeing us be resurrected to life. It gave him the strength to endure the pain that's described in Hebrews 12, 2, Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith, faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus Christ saw our resurrection to life as how we could be partakers with him of his life for eternity. As he said in John 14, 3, John 14, 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. John 14, 18, John 14, 18, I'll not leave you comfortless. I'll come to you yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But you see me, 
Because I live, ye shall live also. And for all eternity, our thinking is going to be what a great cost Jesus Christ paid and endured to purchase our resurrection to life. When God the Father said that Jesus Christ was his beloved son, God the Father was expressing how proud he was with Jesus Christ for not staggering at the cost he had to pay to buy our resurrection. And God the Father spoke about this in Isaiah 42.4. Isaiah 42.4. When God the Father said, Isaiah 42.4, he shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have said judgment in the earth and the isle shall wait for his law. When we look at the life of Jesus Christ, we see a life of determination to bring us life in the resurrection of life. It was hard for him, and God the Father knew that Jesus Christ would not fail until he reached the point in John, uh, the point of John 19.30, John 19.30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it's finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. What Christ finished on the cross was the full purchase of our resurrection to life. He had perfect knowledge in his life. He saw all that he'd have to endure. He saw all that he had to suffer to buy our resurrection to life. And after seeing it all, God the Father said in Isaiah 42.4, Isaiah 42.4, that Jesus Christ would not be discouraged, and he never was discouraged never was discouraged along the way to the point of giving up. As a matter of fact, he spoke about how he did not become discouraged, he did not give up when he saw all that was going to happen to him in Isaiah 50, verse 5. Isaiah 50, 50, verse 5, when he said, The Lord has opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. I gave my back to the smiters my cheeks to them that plucked out the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. For the Lord will help me, therefore I shall not be confused. Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. He is near that justifieth me. Who will contend with me? Let's stand together. Who is mine adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord will help me. Who is he that will condemn me? Lo, they all shall wax old as a garment." One very hard part for Jesus Christ in securing our resurrection to life is how he was all alone. He was all alone with no one to help him but God the Father, and he spoke about this in Isaiah 63.3. Isaiah 63.3, where he said, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me, Psalm 69, 2, Psalm 69, 2, reproach hath broken my heart, I'm full of heaviness. I looked for some to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters I found none. Even though he had to buy our resurrection to life all alone, he didn't flinch. And the record of him all alone buying our resurrection is told in detail in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, which describes him with verses like Isaiah 53, 2, he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form, no comeliness. When we see him, there's no beauty. We should desire him. He's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He's despised. Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, We did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. It says here in Isaiah 53, not 10, Isaiah 53, 10, It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. Prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. He shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, 
will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul unto death, he was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And our response is Isaiah 26, 19. Isaiah 26, 19. Awake and sing. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for our great Savior, without whom we would have no resurrection to life. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus.